Surat Al-Kahf, we have four major stories in it. We will cover. I'm just going to give you an intro, a prelude to the ayah, to the surah, and then we'll go. So first we have the story of the people of the cave, Al-Kahf, right? And then we have the story of the people with the two farms. We'll talk about them. Then we have a third story, a notion to Adam and Iblis. And then we'll have the story of Musa and the pious slave, Al-Khidr, alayhi salam. And then at the end, we will have a story of Dhul Qarnayn, right? So this is most of the ayah. The ayah is about 100 and, uh, 101 and so. Uh, and this 110, uh, 110, right? 110 ayahs. This will be the, the story is basically these four stories will take about 70 some ayahs out of it. And most of the others are either commentary or sealing the ayah with something about qiyamah and something about life. Um, because the surah is Makki, you expect it to talk about the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Lots of belief, lots of issues of belief. And again, uh, oftentimes we take these things lightly because we're Muslims already, so we already believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But see, the surah is talking also about the practical belief or the practical tawheed, the experiential tawheed, not just the theoretical tawheed. Oftentimes, or Muslims obviously believe that Allah is one. There's no God but Him. There is no creator but Him. But it's not just an intellectualization of this. Oh, sure, there's no creator but Him. But what's that? The implication of La ilaha illallah. How do you live and feel and taste La ilaha illallah? That's, the, that's, that's something that we leave sometimes versus just the theoretical belief in La ilaha illallah. All right? So it's the heart, but it's also the experiential. That's why the Quran starts at the beginning. The first thing in the surah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا قيما لينذر بأسا شديدا من لدنه ويبشر المؤمنين الذين يعملون الصالحات أن لهم أجرا حسنا ما كثين فيه أبدا وينذر الذين قالوا اتخذ الله ولدا and warn to those who say Allah has taken a son ما لهم etc. You see the ayahs. So it's talking about what توحيد immediately. Alhamdulillah, and it talks about Allah is not attributed with having a son, etc., etc., all these things. All right, Tawheed. Notice the end of the ayah. How does Allah seal the end of the surah? How does Allah seal Surah Al Kahf? Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Qul innama, you don't have to go through it, I'll, we'll go through it at the end. But the end of the surahs is where Allah says, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Qul innama ana basharum mithlukum yuha ilay, annama ilahukum ilahun wahid. Your Lord is one. It goes again, back. It starts with the Tawheed, it ends with the Tawheed, and you'll see throughout the whole, many aspects throughout the whole surah, Tawheed, Tawheed, Tawheed. And again, I hope that we extract, live the Tawheed rather than just intellectualize it or take it as a theory, accept it as a theory in our minds and our hearts. And that's the whole point. And that's why the Meccan phase, if you remember, in, in the Sahaba, radiallahu anhu, you say, what would keep someone like the family of Ammar, for example, Sumayya and Yasir, the father and the mother of Ammar. I mean, they took the mother of Ammar bin Yasir, radiallahu anha, the, the, among the first shahida of the Sahabiyya, and they tied her up to, uh, to horses from all her limbs and had the horses go in every which direction. That, that she would just, just say, I don't believe in Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa But she would not. Yet the Quran was not entirely revealed even at that time. Yet there's zakah and, 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 and hajj and, and matters, the delicate matters of salah were not even revealed. I mean, there was only, 
this tawheed, this understanding that look, this world is not, you're not the only thing in the world and you're not independent. You are a creation and there is a creator and that creator is just. And whatever you do, you will be accountable. What goes around comes around. And no matter what you do, even if you do worth of an atom, Allah will account you with living in this muraqaba and observation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, living clo with closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, matters of tawheed, knowing who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. This kind of belief they held so precious to it. They held, held, held on to it and they gave their life in that sacrifice. Once you know Tawheed, you'll never let go. Okay. Obviously also, there's few, few kinds of things. Notice also the second, in the second story were the two peoples of, of, of farms. Jannatayn, Al-Quran calls them. Again, I'm just going into some summary at the beginning so we have an understanding of the whole surah before we enter more uh, into more uh, details. These two people, and these two people are happening. Al-Quran tells us after, after the story of the calf of the cave, Al-Quran tells us about now another story. Two people who have farms and one of them is talking to the other. What does he tell them? أَكَفَرْتَ بِالَّذِي خَلَقَكَ مِنْ تُرَابٍ ثُمَّ مِنْ نُطْفَةٍ ثُمَّ, ثم سَوَاكَ رَجُلًا He's telling him, just because you have so much money and all these things, now you think that you are everlasting, you're not gonna be, you're not gonna die and be resurrected. You don't think there's gonna be an end. You don't think there's a creator to this world. Look again, it's talking about Tawheed. And also then, you see about the... After that, the story of Qiyama and Iblis and all this. And Allah says, Unadu Call in the day of judgment, He will tell those people who, who associated partners with Allah, call those partners that you thought were creators. Where are they? The same thing with Al Kahf, uh, with the uh, Afwan, Musa wal Khidr. Alayhi salam. Remember after all these stories with between Musa and Al-Khidr alayhi salam, what does Al-Khidr tell him? وَمَا فَعَلْتُهُ عَنْ أَمْرِي This is rahma min rabbik. This is all rahma from your Lord. And I did not do it by myself. It's all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all along who told me to do what I need to do. Again, it's all taking you and thinning the veils that we're living in. Because we live with so much veils between the soul, the mind, and the body. Right? We have the ruh, the soul, we have the mind, and we have the body. And then between the soul and the mind and the body, we have so many thick veils. So that now, especially after the soul, so that the soul is now out of touch with the mind and out of touch with the body. So basically the body lives for the body. Because mostly now we live for the body. Not even for the mind. How so? I mean, the mind tells you, yeah, you're not supposed to eat a lot, for example, but you do. You're not supposed to eat, to eat bad things, but you do. You're not supposed to smoke, but people do. You're not supposed to do things, but people do. So even the mind goes to correct the body, but the body doesn't respond anymore. There's so many veils that are thick that you can't, the, even the intellectual arguments don't seep through. Don't lie because, I mean, it's wrong. Don't steal because, no, I want to have money. It doesn't matter. Right, wrong, halal, haram, legal, illegal, just give me more money. And obviously the mind is telling you, not about halal, haram. If you steal, you might get caught, you go to jail, it's not good. Doesn't make a difference. Just shut it down. All right? So some people, they thin the veils between the mind and the body. So now the mind respond, the body responds to the mind, to the intellect. All right? Now, be good, eat healthy, do this, do that, you know. You know, be, don't steal because not because it's it's bad. Mind sometimes without the soul, there's no connection. But it's not. You might get caught. The risk is bad. Risk management. All right, and some people just destroy their lives because again, the veils between the mind, the mind and the body are too thick. Now, if the veils between the soul and the mind are thinned, that's the voice of Haq that comes through every human being, irrespective of background. Because the soul was there before you, before your body was created, and before your mind was created. And the soul is that voice of truth that speaks to you. You know when you do something wrong, there's that 
in subdued, soft voice telling you, it doesn't matter what this mufti tells you, it's wrong. It's just wrong. It's wrong to hate. It doesn't matter what they tell you. That's, you feel it's not Islamic. It's not what the Prophet wasallam came to tell us. He did not came, come to tell us to hate. You feel things come out, but because sometimes the veils are thick, we just shut it down. Yeah, just shut up. All right? You don't know. But eventually that soul will speak. Once the body starts dying and the mind obviously gives up, the soul will remain and it'll speak. But the point is to thin those veils and be close to Allah. Because the soul is close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's still pure. You can't tarnish it. You can tarnish your body and then obviously you can distort your mind and thinking. But the soul, it's not up to you. You can't touch it. It's always going to be free. And the point is that you do some soul searching, like they say, and get in touch with your soul. And this is what tazkiyah is. What is tazkiyah and suluk? Or what people call tasawwuf? Or what they call, or best, better yet, ihsan? It's just to get to your soul. So that you don't worship with your body. And you don't worship with your mind only. But there's consistency throughout the body, soul, and mind. Alright. So, the whole thing here again is through the same thing. Notice also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, in this surah also telling him, telling him about this life, that this life, inna ja'alna ma'al ardi zinatan laha. This whole dunya is just temporary and it's just a short period, it's going to end. For those who like you, Ya Rasulullah, and love you, and those who hate you, Ya Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, life is too short. They think they're here everlastingly, they're not. Also, the surah has, as we go through it, we'll see three kinds of kings. It talks about three kings. And again, I always say that because and it's sort of like life. Today we have also three kinds of rulers or politicians or kings or, you know. There's al-malik al-kafir, wal-malik al-zalim, wal-malik al-adil. The kafir king and the zalim king, the oppressor and the adil. Al-kafir, the king that was kafir is the one who was in the king of the, of the city or the land of where the people of the cave, the young people of the cave, right? Because he was kafir and he was tyrant also. And he sort of made an order that if anyone believes, those young people who believe, the people of the cave, the, the young people, if they believe, we will, إِنَّهُمْ يَظْهَرُوا عَلَيْكُمْ يَرْجُمُوكُمْ Al-Quran says. Which means if they catch you, if the king catches you, they will stone you to death. This is how he used to kill people, by stoning them to death. Va kafir and tyrant. There's another uh, king in the, in, the, in, the, in the whole surah of Yusuf, Al-Quran tells us about, and that king is Zalim. Remember when Khidr and Musa alayhi salam, were in the ship, when they first got on board of the ship, what the, what the Quran says, أَمَّا السَّفِينَ فَكَانَتْ لِمَسَاكِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ فِي الْبَحْرِ Al Khidr is telling him, remember a Safina, the ship where, that I made a hole in? This, this ship, Al Quran says, Kanat li masakin ya'maluna fil bahar. The ship belongs to a group of masakin. Masakin means what? What does miskin mean? Huh? What does miskin mean? Poor people? Yeah, but I mean, miskin owns a ship, huh? So, you know, many miskins don't even own anything now. Uh, Al-Quran calls them masakin for a reason, my dear brothers and sisters. Why? Because miskin is not the one who's starving to death all the time. We don't understand that. And sometimes when we give zakah, we want to make sure the person is already dead before we give him. Is he dying already or almost dying so we just can give him? No. 
That's not the point. It's not the point that you wait till the person is dead. And he has to have nothing in order for you to give him. Like as the Quran says, يَحْسَبُهُمُ الْجَاهِلُ أَغْنِيَاءَ مِنَ التعفف. Al-jahil, Al-Quran says, the ignorant thinks about those people who are really needy of zakah. He thinks they are agniya, he thinks they are rich and wealthy. Because they don't beg. So if the needs are missing, the basic needs are missing, that is miskin. So these group of masakin, they may actually own a ship. But it's not sufficing their needs of their families. The basic needs I'm talking about. Huh? Basic needs of their families and children. It's not sufficient. That makes him miskin even if he owns a ship. The basic needs are not there. All right, so that's important. Some other time, we don't wanna, I don't want to take your time talking about this. He says, Al-Khidr told Musa, I, made, I dug a hole. You'll talk about the story, this Musa and Khidr tomorrow. But anyway, let me just give you a preview. Al-Khidr goes and boards the ship with Musa. Al-Khidr takes an axe or something and digs a hole in the, in, in the big hole. He digs it in the ship. Almost the ship is going to sink. And Musa told him, well, what are you doing? And I mean, these people gave us a free ride on their ship and now you're breaking their ship down. You want to sink it? He says, don't, don't talk. Didn't I tell you not to talk to me? Huh? Don't, don't talk to me. Just listen. Huh? At the end when he gave him the reasons why, on the strip of Musa, I know tomorrow Sheikh Saad will talk about, Ahmed Saad will talk about, inshallah, a strip of ilm and adab of ilm and etiquette. And you see all these things. It's a beautiful, beautiful events. And this is really summarizes the journey of the student of knowledge. Huh? Not that, wait a minute. Does that mean a student of knowledge has no right to ask? Like Al-Khidr told Musa. What did Musa do? Did he listen to him? Did Musa listen to Al-Khidr? Or did he, keep, did he keep questioning him? Huh? Absolutely. And if Musa السلام, did not question him, he would have been sinful. What do you mean? He saw wrong being done. He was obligated to question wrong. You don't just sit below, oh, you know, don't question, no, no, don't question. Though Musa al-Khidr were anbiya, huh? to say the least, inshallah ta'ala. Yani on many of the accounts, al-Khidr alayhi salam was a nabi, as Imam Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani mentions. Some people say he was not nabi, like it's a huge possibility. And many of Ahlul Ilm want to say that al-Khidr alayhi salam was a nabi, in fact. Even then, Musa was obligated to ask. He had to, he had to object. Are you doing something wrong? I'm not going to just sit here and tell me. Tell me you, you give me a good reason. Come. When he told him, he told him, remember the ship I made a hole in? He says, yeah. He says, وَأَمَّا السَّفِينَةُ فَكَانَتْ لِمَسَاكِينَ What you didn't know, O Musa, is the ship belongs to a group of poor, needy people. Huh? Impoverished. You know, there's no, uh, and, yeah, they were working. يَعْمَنُونَ فِي الْبَحْرِ فَأَرَدْتُ أَنْ أَعِيبَهَا He told him, he told Musa, I want to make a hole in it to make it ugly and not worth anything. So, because after that, the ship goes through, if the king sees there was a king, وَكَانَ وَرَاءَهُمْ مَلِكْ يَأْخُذُ كُلَّ سَفِينَةٍ غَصْبًا And there was a king there that he takes every ship that he likes because out of greed. But if he sees a ship that's broken and ugly, he's not going to take it. That's why I dug a hole. So he, again, there's a king that was kafir, and there was a king that was zalim, and there was a king that was adil, or that was just at the end of the story, Dhul Qarnayn, right? Dhul Qarnayn was a king, and he was a just, and the Quran talks about him in a very just way. Etc., etc. And it means those who do believe and do good, they will be rewarded by us. That's based on the, the, the three kings here. Also, it has four things, that I, if I may say. Uh, four stories within stories. Issues that we need to go in sometimes. Number one, the story of the people of the cave. What does it tell us? 
among the most important things. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wasbir nafsaka ma'al ladhina yad'oona rabbahum bil-ghadati wal-ashiyyi yuriduna wajha. Be patient and remain with those who are seeking their Lord and they're making dhikr of him in the day, in the morning and at night. Majalis al-dhikr. Al-Quran is telling the Prophet ﷺ, remain with those who are remembering their Lord in the morning and at night. And this is the majlis of dhikr. In the morning and at night. And as if life without these majalis of dhikr in the morning and at night is not worth much. Therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet ﷺ, stay with those people. Those people who you reduna wajha, يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِي They are in dhikr of their Lord in the morning and at night. That's what life is all about. And today we have to ask ourselves about majalis of dhikr. Again, it's just among the important things. That no, Among the things. The other thing also in this, in this Surah Al-Kahf is the... Remember the two people who are the people of the farms, the two farmlands? One is visiting the other and reminding him with Allah. That's all the visit. We, Al-Quran has given us a visit. Two people are visiting. One is visiting the other. And he's reminding him with Allah. Now we visit each other often. Or maybe not. Now we don't even visit each other. Though a Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the authentic hadith says, Wajabat. محبتي للمتزاورين المتحابين فيه والمتزاورين فيه حديث قدسي where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says my love will be granted my love the love of Allah will be it's an authentic narration huh? will be granted to those who visit each other for my sake and look this this event which we will go through inshallah also tells us these people who this man who visited the other man he didn't say anything just about Allah for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the question is, do we visit again? Things that we need to be learning from these things is imbibe these things. Do we make intentions to visit each other just for the sake of Allah? And we talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't mean you don't say how are you doing or how are you. Huh? You say that. But also, you ask him, how's your heart with Allah today? And remind them with Allah. Because we always ask ourselves, how are you and how are you doing? But we don't ask ourselves, how is your heart with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala today? And I'm going to ask you this question. How is your heart with Allah today? And that's a question you should answer, you ask yourself every day. And you should have an answer for that. Whether it's the same like yesterday, whether it's worse, whether it's more distant from Allah than it was yesterday, whether it's indifferent. Or you don't have a heart. These two people of the farm, you see, they're visiting each other for the sake of Allah. They talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the man reminds him with Allah in a nice way. In a non-self-righteous way. So that's the second here thing that we take also. And also now the, the, third, the third story among the four stories uh, is the Musa al-Khidr tells you the story of seeking knowledge and the adab of seeking knowledge. And remember that Musa al-Khidr went from diff to different countries, different cities in, in nowadays, different countries in nowadays. Safar, traveling for the sake of knowledge. Getting out of your comfort zone. And spending time for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, Dhul Qarnayn, another story of Dhul Qarnayn is, you know, supposedly he lived 200 years or so according to some of Sirin. And also he went from the east of the world to the west of the world. In, 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 in giving da'wah and all these things. 